Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everybody, welcome to this lecture of, of the second week of the lecture 8 on great experiments in psychology. In today's class, we shall study something very different from what we have been studying so far. So, we have been talking about memory and we spoke about Ebbinghaus and we spoke about uh, Loftus and Palmer study uh, where uh, the applications of memory research were on uh, real time and especially in the um, legal cells. And now, today's, in today's class, we are going to talk about emotion and perception. So, do you think that emotion can really have any impact on what we perceive and how we perceive and how we report it? So, this study was conducted by E. McGuinness in 1949. So, just imagine so many years ago and he spoke about emotionality and perceptual defense. Now, a commonly held view of perception is that it is an active process and it is influenced by motivational, emotional and cognitive processes. The opposite view is of a passive receipt of sensory uh, information from and about the external world. So, basically when we are talking of perception, we are actually talking of sensation with meaning. So, if we look at perception um, in this way that there is a stimulus and that uh, when attended to that stimulus, then it gives us, uh, we gives, give it some meaning. So, there is an understanding component that is added on to the stimulus and then we say, ah, oh, this is a light coming from the, this is the uh, uh, light of the train. But before that, when it is on a stimulus level, we perceived, we just saw the stimulus and it produced, produced a visual sensation. So, this that is a light and gradually that light gave us the meaning. Now, and um, this is how perception was earlier studied. Then there were some researchers who said that no, perception is not only uh, just how we uh, that stimulus, the individual is not passive and it is just not the stimulus uh, being uh, seen and comprehended and responded to just in the objective way. As the, so, the report is not as per the stimulus only, uh, but it is also dependent on the organism. So, that is the individual and how he actually comprehends the stimulus. So, the understanding mechanism here differs because of uh, several other uh, processes within the individual. And it was seen that there are six type of motivational emotional influences on perception. And Allport spoke about them in 1955, where he says that the six types of motivational emotional influences on perception are the value of objects, bodily needs, rewards and punishment, individual values that we play that, that we pay to the stimulus, personality of the individual and the emotional connotation. So, all these actually all these factors affect how the individual is looking at a stimulus and how the individual is perceiving it. And of these two, two very important factors are impo uh, related to perceptual defense. So, that is the value of objects and emotional connotation, we will come to that soon. So, um, the question that arises is do we, when we are talking of perceptual defense, it is basically uh, whether we perceive things in a way to block unpleasant uh, things, unpleasant stimulus from entering our perception. So, uh, the question that thus comes into being is do we block out some things from our perception because they are unpleasant to us? What do you think? Human beings do block out some stimuli 
and human beings protect themselves from perceiving stimuli that are hurtful and op offensive. And the idea of perceptual defense suggests that on occasions human beings do not perceive a specific sensory stimulus that is a word or an image especially if it has a vulgar connotation because we have a filtering mechanism or perceptual wall preventing the sensory data from being processed. So, uh, we have a screening mechanism where we uh, in, in a certain way we screen out the unwanted unpleasant stuff from entering our senses. Now, is that possible? So, this theory was suggested by uh, Postman and others in 1948 and McGuinness in 1949 and it refers to the findings from the laboratory experiments that suggest that subliminally perceived words, subliminally perceived means that are just below the conscious level that the those words that evoke unpleasant stimulus uh, emotions take longer to perceive consciously than neutral words. Now, actually you know that this is true McGuinness showed it through his laboratory experiments and that too way back in 1949. So, that when we do not wish to uh, perceive a certain word, we uh, may be aware of it, but there is some filter mechanism that is working and we keep it from our conscious self. So, he showed this through experiments. So, the value of objects refers so, as I mentioned in the uh, first slide that uh, you know the value of objects and the emotional connotation are two major factors that are important for perception, especially for perceptual defense. Here, I will just elaborate a little on that. So, the value of objects refers to the phenomena of perceptual accentuation accentuation that is or sensitization. So, um, whether um, whether that a subject um, an object is important for us or has a certain value to us will be seen as larger, brighter or more attractive or more valuable and so on than those which are not. Several studies have been conducted on it and, is, and a very famous study shows that uh, you know the the size of the coin the size of a coin was uh, for two, two children who were um, uh, very poor, the size of the coin was larger as compared to children who were from the richer families. So, um, the, this is so the value of the object also accentuates the size. So, it is perceived as larger. Similarly, other studies showed that uh, individuals who have who are kept hungry, they uh, see the food objects, food items first when they are displayed with several objects, imageries of several objects. So, they spot the food objects first. Also, the size of the objects are larger and in fact, these studies a lot of such studies were uh, conducted during the world wars and it was seen though the most of the studies have not been published due to the way they have been uh, they were conducted, but they also show that the accentuation uh, of the object is uh, basically the per there is a perceptual accentuation because of the value of value that is attained value that is um, uh, added to the object per se. Also another important factor is the emotional connotation. So, the accentuation of negative, negative or anxiety or frustrating producing stimuli. And basically, so um, if there is an emotional connotation to a certain stimuli, the um, uh, there is an accentuation of that stimuli. So, it uh, creates uh, uh, an, an arousal. Uh, to the individual. So, especially if they are of uh, negative emotions. Now, and recognition can occur before the perception enters the conscious awareness. As I was saying that it creates an arousal and the individual is aware of that before the individual is conscious of it. Now, is that possible? You are aware of a stimulus and you are not conscious of it. Actually, uh, this is what uh, McGuinness showed through his uh, experiment. 
and one of the um, uh, uh, ways to identify whether an individual is aware of a stimulus is through the arousal mechanism and uh, that is uh, through the autonomic arousal mechanism. So, as we basically know that a part of the brain. So, if you consider the two types of nervous system one the system uh, sympathetic um, the autonomic central nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system that is it consists of the sympathetic activation system and the parasympathetic activation system. The so, that uh, sympathetic activation system is primarily responsible for the arousal mechanism and uh, the autonomic activity or the sympathetic activity can be objectively understood uh, through a um, objectively measured through a galvanic scan response recorder. So, basically um, this measures the skin's uh, resistance to electricity. So, two electrodes are placed on the fingers and it actually measures the skin resistance that is uh, which decreases as anxiety is raised and there is more sweating. So, if you wish to understand the autonomic arousal or the arousal of the individual as I said the awareness if we go back a little the awareness can be measured through arousal and arousal can be measured through the GSR or the galvanic skin response recorder. So, um, that basically McGuinness this was already being used to understand autonomic activity and McGuinness plan to use this. So, when we are talking of the subception effect or basically in of um, stimulus that is creating an awareness just below the conscious level, there the enough information is transmitted to the autonomic nervous system to determine different levels of GSR. So, there is a physical awareness of the stimulus, but there is not a conscious awareness. So, is that possible? Yes, that the body is aware of the stimulus, but so the stimulus has created a sensation which has created because of the emotional connotation it has created a certain amount of triggering response and the body is aware of the stimulus, but consciously there is no verbal identification of the stimulus. So, the individual is not verbally aware of the stimulus. So, let us see this is possible. So, McGinn is basically wish to explore the question how is a raised or lowered recognition threshold for harmful stimulus objects achieved before the observer discriminates them and becomes aware of their threatening character. So, what is he trying to say that how is a raised or lowered recognition threshold. So, uh, something that is below it uh, is higher or is uh, below the threshold. So, uh, the that is the point of understanding or say the point from where we are aware consciously. So, before that if there is just below the threshold, um, if there is um, if there is any stimulus object does that create um, how, how is that recognized and before the subject before the individual actually becomes aware of the threatening character of the stimulus. So, um, say uh, a, w a word. So, McGinn is actually used words. So, say if there is a word which is um, which is unpleasant. So, how early is it noticeable and is it noticeable on the arousal level while it is not noticeable in the verbal level. So, is that possible? So, McGinn is hypothesized that detecting any one aspect of autonomic arousal uh, that accompanies perceptual behavior should highlight or elucidate on the process involved in perceptual defense. So, where is the defense mechanism starting? Where are we blocking the stimulus? So, um, from entering our perception. So, taking GSR as a measure of autonomic arousal, again is predicted that there will be a significant change in GSR in reaction to visually presented stimuli with emotional or emotive connotations before the participant is able to report the exact nature of the stimulus compared with stimuli without such connotations. So, basically what is he trying to do? That there will be he is he is hypothesizing that the GSR will record the 
arousal before the individual actually identifies the word. The mean recognition threshold for the words with emotive connotations will be significantly higher than for words without emotive connotations. So, that is it will take time, it will take more time to recognize the emotional words. So, that is because of the perceptual defense working, it will take more time to break that defense and enter into our consciousness, though the uh, individual will be aware of that word earlier. So, the higher recognition threshold for emotional content represents the concept of perceptual defense as you well understand that uh, it is taking longer time to enter into our conscious level because it is being obstructed. So, because of the perceptual defense the unpleasant stimuli is not being able to get into consciousness. Now, how would you do that in an experiment? So, um, Megan is created a repeated measures design and he was going to do that experiment over to check out the results and he chose 16 participants from his elementary psychology class and two experimental conditions they were presented to. So, he presented with 18 words, 11 neutral and 7 emotionally toned. And what was he measuring? He was measuring the galvanic skin response and the mean recognition threshold. So, how long did it take for the individual to recognize the words? Okay. And the independent variable in this uh, case were the stimulus words themselves. So, of which 11 were neutral words and 7 were emotionally toned words. So, these are the words as you can see many of them have a uh, uh, a, a connotation, a sexual connotation related to it. And these words were presented so with uh, by the help of a tachistoscope. I have just tried to provide a picture of the tachistoscope. This is of course, uh, from another experiment primarily Sperry's experiment and this um, I could not find an image of McGuinness uh, tachistoscope. So, if you, you perhaps may uh, find it uh, uh, through the search engines. Um, so, what was the method followed? The words were presented by a tachistoscope. Tachistoscope was very frequently used in psychology experiments before the computer came into being. So, it was a way to present words on a screen for a certain amount of time. So, the there was a, a control of time was um, could be done and for the exposure of the stimulus. So, uh, the words were presented via a tachistoscope which allowed control variation of exposure time starting at 0 0.01 seconds. Each participant sat in front of the tachistoscope with electrodes uh, strapped to both palms for measuring the GSR galvanic skin response. So, basically it would be a measure of the arousal. Each participant's threshold was first determined for four trial words. By exposing the words one set 0 0.01 seconds, one set 0 0.02 seconds, and so on until it was correctly identified. So, basically, we, and it was seen that whether they could actually identify the words, neutral words, so these were trial words at 0 0.01 seconds and 0 0.02 seconds. Then, the real experimental words of the experiment, uh, the experimental stimuli were uh, shown. So, um, as you can see, uh, most of the critical words are relating to uh, vulgarity or uh, relating to um, taboo words in society. So, the instructions were before the experiment began participants were told that they would be given words, they would be shown words which they might not be able to recognize at first. They were instructed to report whatever they saw or thought they saw on each exposure. Mind you, it is for 0 0.01 seconds regardless of what it was. So, they were just supposed to report what they saw or what they thought they saw. So, uh, the results show that uh, emotionality was significantly greater during pre recognition exposures of the critical than the neutral words. So, there was an arousal in the higher arousal for the critical words. So, that is or the more vulgar words. Hmm. It was seen that the GSR showed a higher reading 
as compared to the non uh, neutral words or the non vulgar words or the non taboo words if we put it like this. So, uh, as you can see these are the higher uh, recordings and these are all related to the uh, non, non taboo words uh, sorry taboo words. The second hypothesis uh, was um, the about the threshold. So, where the mean recognition thresholds were greater for the critical than the neutral words. So, it took more time to actually understand what the critical word was. So, it took more time as you can see it took more than 12 seconds to uh, understand that the word shown was raped as compared to apple which was a neutral word. On the other hand like uh, similar with whore or belly. So, whore it took the longest time. So, it took more than 0.14 seconds to uh, actually understand that this word was whore as compared to the say glass or sleeve. Now, if you see that this is also whore is also a five letter word sleep is also a five letter word and in fact all of them are, but then why is there a difference in the recognition time. So, McGuinness said that it seems clear that emotional reactivity as measured by GSR that there is an arousal that actually accompanies perceptual defense. So, what is happening that there is a higher arousal as you can see from this there is a higher arousal for the non uh, for the taboo words. So, that is raped belly or cortex which is a sanitary napkin penis filth and bitch. So, these these have these are these uh, the arousal level is higher when you are seeing these words, but so suppose if the arousal level is higher then expected as per um, common sense that they would be seen earlier, but that is not true. So, that just shows that perceptual defense there must be something blocking that actually stops them from being significantly aware. So, visually or uh, aware of the of the stimulus or being conscious of the stimulus actually takes time. Now, uh, this so he showed that GSR does um, um, emotional reactivity as measured by GSR does accompany perceptual defense. Emotionality was significantly greater during pre recognition exposure of the critical words and of the neutral words as we saw in hypothesis 1 and the mean recognition thresholds were significantly greater for the critical words. So, that is it took them more time to see or understand the emotionally charged words. Now, one of the major criticisms of McGuinness study was that this study was created at a time when taboo words were really taboo. So, you did not speak about uh, rape or a bitch or um, cortex uh, a sanitary napkin in public especially when you were trying to um, when you were a participant when you were a subject in a research in front of other uh, people other researchers of the scientific or the people of the scientific community. So, the, it was uh, said that probably the subjects were too embarrassed to say those words aloud. So, the emotional reactivity part that uh, that, that they, uh, these words created an arousal that was understandable, but that uh, these individuals the subjects did not say the words aloud because of perceptual defense may not be true. So, that is what the critics said that it was perhaps because these uh, subjects were too embarrassed to say them aloud this was 1949. So, 
this was um, shown in another in another study in 1953 when uh, the when Bitterman and Niffin asked the subjects to write down the words. So, they said that there, there was no difference in the threshold between the taboo words and the non taboo words. So, that is the emotionally charged words and the uh, non charged words, the neutral words. So, again there was another contradiction to the study which said that perceptual defense works primarily for, uh, uh, for words when we are trying to be conscious of them or saying them aloud, but that was one of the criticisms. And the other one said, uh, this was again by Lacey et al. in 1953 and Postman in 1953 that says that perceptual defense effect could be eliminated if participants were warned that emotive words uh, would be shown. So, if they were told from before, if they were prepared, then probably uh, th they would be um, comfortable with seeing uh, stating the words aloud. So, perhaps um, that would make them less embarrassed and awkward in seeing, uh, they would feel less awkward in seeing something uh, randomly and uh, assuming that uh, to be a taboo word. So, this assuming a taboo, taboo word and saying it out aloud may have been awkward for people, but if they actually saw, if they were warned from before that you may be shown some such words, then uh, there was um, when they in such a study it was seen that they did not, there was no difference between the emotionally charged words and the non-emotional words. But no matter what the criticisms were of McGuinness study, why we have taken this study today is because it has uh, a major implication in other areas of work. And in fact, one of the major implications of uh, this study was primarily in uh, advertising. But before that, we will uh, also see that a lot of subsequent research followed uh, this work. And uh, as you see that this research is quite similar to Freud's repression hypothesis. So, Freud where Freud said that um, we, we, we do not uh, remember words that are unpleasant or we, we repress memories of events that are unpleasant. So, uh, this is one of his forget theories of forgetting where he suggests that unpleasant material, unpleasant imagery unpleasant uh, events are actually repressed by our mind into the post into the unconscious and we tend to forget it. So, McGinney's study is quite similar to Freud's repression hypothesis. Dixon uh, in 1971 reviewed several studies and here he showed that verbal stimuli that are too quick or too dim to be consciously perceived will nonetheless affect the participants associative processes. So, even if they are uh, that is just below the threshold point, it will still affect the way an individual processes the information or um, uh, associates the information. Marcel and Patterson also showed in 1978 that associations following the subliminal perception of a word were linked to its meaning. So, even if it is below the threshold, uh, the associations are linked to its meaning. And Tyrer also showed in 78 that participants self rating of anxiety increased following subliminal perceptions uh, presentations of unpleasant words such as cancer. So, basically work on subliminal perceptions started way back in 1949 with McGuinney's work and that is why it makes this study very important. You see when we are talking about uh, one of the reasons why I have introduced this as one of the major studies that we need to um, understand uh, is because this used uh, uh, physiological um, measurement. So, primarily the galvanic skin response recorder to show that um, uh, to measure uh, per the perceptual process. And here, so it was trying to link it to the biological mechanism that is related to perception. So, we are trying to understand the psychological phenomena of perceptual defense and we are also trying to relate it to the biological phenomena of arousal. So, McGinnis did it in 1949 and the implications of research as I was mentioning right now has a lot of uh, evidence later on in um, 
advertising and in also in brain studies fmri studies showed that unconsciously perceived fearful faces produce greater activity in the amygdala than happy faces now um, evidence for unconscious perception challenges ideas of consciousness yes this is also very important that uh, earlier it was uh, basically thought of that uh, there are some things that are within just in consciousness and out of consciousness. But this experiment suggests that sensory information is processed in a wide variety of ways with different consequences for different kinds of behavior and there are um, there is nothing that is ever in or out of consciousness. There are indicators of consciousness where we see verbal reports or choices that are made in perceptual stimuli and unconsciousness uh, are indicators of unconsciousness being biological mechanisms, especially uh, brain activity and also reflex mechanisms. But nothing is actually in and out of consciousness. So, it does not shift from uh, being uh, out of consciousness to in consciousness. So, there would be just different ways of studying that, um, uh, that um, uh, stimulus. Um, so, uh, as I was mentioning this uh, work has been um, influencing the subliminal perception in the uh, the subliminal perception in advertising. Uh, basically, uh, this was taken up in a very uh, powerful way in uh, by uh, 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 the U.S. market, especially by Jim Vickery, who arranged with an owner of New Jersey Cinema to install a second special projector, which during the film flashed on the screen faces like hungry, eat popcorn, drink Coca Cola, and they flashed so quickly uh, between the film that and it was or it was printed so faintly that they could not be consciously perceived. So, if you ask the individual who was watching the movie at that time in the movie hall that um, did you see uh, an ad of Coca Cola or uh, was there any suggestion uh, was there any write up saying you are you feeling hungry eat popcorn. Nobody could consciously report it, but they uh, the sale of Coca Cola as well as cop popcorn increased during the intervals. So, um, that is uh, during the movie intervals. So, um, uh, this uh, was uh, basically uh, banned later on in US and in England primarily because there was a huge ban of protest which said that this was un an unethical way of uh, using. Um, of manipulating an individual by using subliminal perception, but that just uh, an invading invading privacy, but that just shows that subliminal perception is actually there. So, the controversy about perceptual defense in the 50s led to the understanding of perceptual discrimination as a conservative criterion and this is till date studied in several universities. As you will see that the, the advertising media is still um, influenced by uh, uh, studies on perceptual defense and actually they use a lot of emotional content. You will often see especially in Indian advertisements, you will often see the use of emotional content especially mother and child or a baby or uh, relationships. Um, especially uh, the big companies, they often use um, emotional content to stir up the um, individual without uh, that is the target audience. Now, uh, they still use uh, the concepts that started way back in 1949 with the idea of perceptual defense. So, uh, in fact, you can if you, you can still go through the studies where um, there are several universities uh, who uh, one of them I was just going through some papers by New York University, which show that um, the selection of a stimulus, the selection of a, um, a desired stimulus is based on uh, different perceptual discrimination criteria. So, you can go through these studies, they are really interesting and it all began in uh, way back in 1949. So, I would end my lecture by saying that um, you see uh, there are in cognitive and social psychology there are a lot of interesting studies and especially uh, this study has a major role to show how emotion and 
how uh, we perceive social stimuli actually uh, or how we look at uh, social stimuli is various times influenced by the values we add on to it and what the emotional connotations we add on to it. Thank you.